One of the first things that got me interested in linguistics uh, back when I was a kid was learning about the history of the English language. And you really can't talk much about the history of the English language without talking about this one uh, amazing text we have from the Old English period, which is Beowulf. Um, if you haven't encountered Old English before, it's a very, very different language from modern English, and uh, it's basically impossible to read without special training. So, whether you want to go on to read Beowulf in Old English, uh, or if you just want to gain a sense of appreciation of what uh, a translator uh, from Old English has to deal with, this video is here to serve as your linguistic guide. I'm going to be going through the first three lines of Beowulf in the original Old English and basically going word by word and over explaining the whole thing. This is my first foray into YouTube proper, um, recording a video specifically for YouTube, so uh, please bear with me as I learn the ropes. I'm sure there will be uh, little hiccups here and there, but uh, there's nowhere to go but up from here. So. Without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so given that this is the first time I'm doing something like this, I'd like to lay a little groundwork before we dive into what each word means. So let's take a look at the text overall, focusing on some really general things. And if this is your first time seeing Old English, you might be wondering at this point, is this Really? Do you have the right language here? This is English? Um, yes, this is English. Circa a thousand years ago. It's been a busy millennium. But even before we talk about what it means, or what it sounds like, I want to point out that what I'm showing you here is not what the text looks like in the actual manuscript where Beowulf is written. That manuscript and there's only one of them, uh, it looks like this. Notice that there are no markings above the letters, no uh, vertical lines. Uh, the different lines of poetry aren't even on different lines. Writing the text in that way, where each poetic line appears on a different line on the page, is a modern editorial choice. Another modern device is using these two vertical lines that you see appear in the center of every line uh, in the modern version. These are used to mark the spot in the middle of every line called the cesura. The cesura is a very important landmark in the construction of a line of Old English poetry, which is why we sometimes mark it off in modern editions. Another difference between the manuscript version and our version that we're using here is that ours has been augmented by some editorial help like the dots that appear above certain G's and the lines that appear above certain vowels. In a nutshell, these are there to help us know how to pronounce certain letters, which could be pronounced in one of two different ways. While we're on the topic of pronunciation, uh, it might be fun now to show you what these three lines sounded like, or at least what we think they sounded like. I'm not sure if hearing the pronunciation will make it more or less familiar, but here goes. What? We gardena in yar darum, theod kuninga thrum ye frunon, who thaw atherlingas ellen fremedon. Right. Well, now that you've heard that, you might be wondering, what does it mean? Okay, I'll give you a little rough translation here. It means something like, Ah, we've found out about the force of the folk kings, of the spear Danes in days gone by, how the princes performed deeds of courage. If that meaning didn't exactly shine through when you heard the original, don't adjust your TV. Most of the words in this passage are no longer used in any form in modern English. But even those words which have fallen out of use still have some connections to more familiar ones which we'll see as we go on. One thing you may have noticed about my little attempt at a translation there is that I tried to include some alliteration on every line. Alliteration occurs when successive stressed syllables start with the same sound. So an example from the translation would be found out about the force of the folk kings. 
Now, I didn't just add this alliteration to the modern English version to be cool. It's actually something that occurs in the Old English as well. In fact, Old English verse is alliterative by nature. So every line shows an example of alliteration. The details of how this works exactly get a bit intricate, but to sum it up, both halves of the line, that is, the part on either side of the cesura, see how important that is, both sides have to have an alliterative link between them. So, as an example, in the line Feld Kuninga Thrym Jefrunon, we have alliteration of this sound represented by, well, it's a letter that looks like a combination of a lowercase b and a lowercase p. It's called thorn, and it represents the sound th, like thin, or the, as in that, depending on where exactly in the word it finds itself. In this line, we are alliterating the word in the first half, Theod Kuninga, with the word Thrym in the second half. As I said, the rules do get more complicated than that, but I think that's enough to get us started. So let's move on, and let's look at these lines one word at a time. The first word we come to in all of Beowulf is the word Hwat. And if you know one word in Old English, it has a good chance of being this one. Hwat generally has the meaning what, as in what do you want? And in fact, what is the ancestor of our modern English word what. But here, what is not being used in exactly this way. Rather, what is acting as an interjection, something that opens up the poem by calling our attention to what's about to come. Translating this into modern English is, well, hard. One way of doing so might be something like listen, as in Listen, you got to stop writing these epic poems. Or, you know, as in, you know, I'd like to tell you about a guy named Beowulf. Another alternative would be something like, ah, as I translated above, ah, or so, as Seamus Heaney translated it. Since this is literally the first word in the poem, and it can be translated in so, so many ways, it presents an opportunity for the translator to set the tone. It's a tip-off as to what sort of a translation this is going to be. Is this going to be an elevated, archaic translation? Go with low, like Tolkien did. Is this going to be a contemporary, iconoclastic translation? You can always use bro, as Maria Devana Headley did in her 2020 translation. Then we come to way. Way is fortunately pretty simple. It's the ancestor of we, as in you know, me and some other people. Uh, it has the same meaning in Old English, too. The sound spelled like E with a line over it uh, is pronounced as a long A sound. Uh, this often corresponds to an E in Modern English. So Old English we gives us Modern English we. Now, normally, in Modern English, once we hear we, we expect to hear about what we did. In other words, we expect to hear the verb. Not always the case in Old English, though, and not the case here. In fact, we won't get to the verb, jefrunon, uh, which means found out or learned, until the end of line two, the end of line two. Next up is gardena. This is a compound word composed of gar, on the one hand, which means spear, and dene, which means the Danes, on the other. Gar, meaning spear, is a word that we've lost in modern English, at least on its own, but it does survive in another word, garlic, which was originally a compound word meaning spear leak. Dene, on the other hand, is familiar enough from the word Denmark, the Danes mark, an archaic word meaning border or land. Um, interestingly, the modern English word Dane it seems to come not from the Old English Dene, which would give us something like Dean in Modern English, but from the Old Norse equivalent. So together, Gar Dene are the Spear Danes. This is just one of many names uh, the Danes are given throughout Beowulf. But what about that suffix, that ending on the end of Gar Dene, that A? Ah. That is no accident. 
that is not a spelling mistake. What that is, is the genitive plural ending. If you're not familiar with that terminology, think of it as meaning of spear Danes. Of is a good way of translating the genitive. Uh, it's the form, well, it's one form uh, used to express possession in Old English. So if we were to do a literal translation of what we've looked at so far, we'd have, ah, we of spear Danes, dot, dot, dot. Next, we have this little phrase, in yar dagum. This is an idiomatic phrase, uh, meaning something like in days of yore, in olden times, in days gone by, that kind of thing. But we can also break it down to look at the literal meaning of each of the parts. First, we have in, which is maybe the only word in this passage that both sounds and means roughly the same thing nowadays as it did in the Old English period. Then we have yar darum. This is actually another compound, originally at least. Uh, it comes from the two words yar, which means year, and dai, which means day. It's probably a good time to talk a little bit about pronunciation, because this word shows us a few potentially unexpected things. First of all, when the letter G is written with a dot over it, it is pronounced as a Y sound, as in young or year, which, incidentally, uh, is the direct descendant of this word yar. Yar, year. There's another marking we need to concern with ourselves uh, in this word as well, which is that line over the the E. Uh, this line, which is called a macron, or a macron, depending on how you say it, um, this line indicates that we're dealing with a long vowel. And a long vowel in Old English means literally a vowel held for longer. So you'd have, for example, a short oo versus a long oo. Uh, in this case, we have the, the macron appearing over the sequence uh, of E and A. Uh, this is likely representing a diphthong, which is a vowel sound that glides from one vowel quality to another, but is treated as a kind of unit. Uh, the exact pronunciation of this diphthong is not totally certain, but one common reconstruction is a, ah, going from the a ah of hat to the a ah of father, or something like that. The role of the macron here is to show us that the diphthong occupies the same length of time as a long vowel would. Also, remember that the dot and the macron are not present in the Old English manuscripts. They're just here because editors of texts sometimes want to be nice to us, especially in material aimed at beginners. The only other unexpected thing to talk about in yar darum is the pronunciation of that second dotless G. In this context, uh, the letter G is pronounced as what's called a voiced velar fricative. This is the r sound that some people make when they say ugh. So darum, not dagum. That form, darum, is the dative plural form of the word dai, day. If that terminology is also unfamiliar to you, just think of it as the form that has to occur after the preposition in. You can translate it here simply as days. So in yar darum, in year days, or idiomatically in days of yore. Now the astute observers among you may be asking, wait a second, I thought all lines were supposed to alliterate. What's alliterating here in huat we gardena in yer darum? And the answer is actually gardena and yer darum. Even though the two words don't sound like they start with the same sound to us, after all, one is g and one is y, gardena, yar darum. In the Old English poetic tradition, they count as the same sound for the purposes of alliteration. That's one of those complications I was alluding to earlier. Anyway, to bring our hyperliteral translation up to date, uh, we would now have, ah, we of spear Danes in year days. Moving on, we have the word Theod Kuninga, which means of folk kings. And this is another compound of the word Theod, which means people or nation, and Kuning, which means king. And here again we have that genitive plural ending 
a, like with gardena, uh, theodkuninga. This means of folk kings. The word theod has not given us any direct descendants, but it is related somewhat indirectly to the word Dutch, or for that matter, Deutsch uh, in German, which comes from a word meaning of the people. Uh, the old English equivalent of that word would have been, uh, or rather was, theodish. Theodish, of the people, public. The other half of theodkuning is kuning, which survives a albeit a bit worn down, as our word king. That letter Y, by the way, represents the U sound as in German über or French lune. The word kuning is related to the word that comes down to modern English as kin, along with the suffix ing, which is a very, very frequent suffix in Old English, which means belonging to or having to do with or even descended from. So a kuning is someone who has to do with the kyn, the kin, or someone who descends from the kin. We'll see this suffix again very soon. Okay, onwards then, to thrym, which I've translated above as force. It has a more literal meaning, band of people or crowd, but uh, it also is used more figuratively with the meaning force or glory. Uh, Not a word that survived past the Middle English period, so we don't have any descendant of it. But at least with thrym, then, under our belts, we finally completed our noun phrase gardena in jerdagum, theod kuninga thrym. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but it means the force of the folk kings of the Spear Danes in days gone by. Or maybe it does. We could also interpret this phrase a little bit differently. One of the most common devices used in Old English poetry, and it's certainly all over the place in Beowulf, is variation. Variation is when something in a sentence gets referred to in more than once in different terms each time. So to give you a modern example, we might say, Then Colin, that brave man, the linguist, opened his email. What we're saying is, Colin, in other words that brave man, in other words, the linguist, opened his email. So here, maybe Gardena and Theodkuninga are in this kind of relationship to each other. In that case, we'd have to translate it as the force of the folk kings, in other words, the spear Danes, in days gone by. Although you might want to take out that in other words, if you're doing a nice translation. In this case, we'd have to understand Gardene, as referring not to all the Danish people, but merely to their kings. That way, Gardena and Theodkuninga would be referring to the same people. Either way, it doesn't change the meaning of the noun phrase very much. Uh, And hey, we've got our noun phrase complete now. So all we need is a verb. And finally, finally, we get one. Jefrunon. This is a form of the verb Jefrinan, or Frinan, Uh, which means to find out or learn by asking. This word technically did come down into modern English, technically, although not quite all the way down to the present. The modern English version is frain, meaning ask, which is recorded even into the 19th century. That frain, by the way, is not related to refrain, which comes from French and Latin, but it is related to the German fragen, which means ask. Here, Jefrinan shows up in its past tense form, which is where the U in the middle comes from, Jefrunon, and it's conjugated to agree with its subject We, which is where the On at the end comes from, Jefrunon. So we should translate this as something like we found out about or we learned of. Now we are finally in a position to make a complete sentence, uh, which you could translate in a very hyperliteral way as Ah, we of spear Danes in year days of folk king's force learned of. Or if we want to put that in a more natural word order for modern English, ah, we learned of the force of folk kings of spear Danes in year days. So with that, we would have a complete sentence, but why are we not done? We're not done because the poet goes on, telling us more about what we've heard, what we've learned of. And this is actually another instance of variation. Yes, we've heard of the force of the folk kings, etc., but we've also heard, 
who thought Adelingas ellen fremedon. So we get this clause here, giving us another description of the force of the folk kings. This clause starts out with who, or how, and this is another tip, just as the long a in Old English often corresponds to modern English e, so too does the Old English u often correspond to a modern English ow. So who gives us how. Then we have this word thaw, which is a form of the Old English definite article, uh, which corresponds to the modern English the. Uh, that character in thaw, by the way, is referred to um, by modern scholars as ev, and it's pronounced basically exactly like thorn. Uh, so in other words, th or the, as in think or weather, uh, depending on where in the word it is. Here, it's at the start of the word, so it's th, as in think, thaw. Anyway, thaw is a plural form, so we'd expect a plural noun coming after it, and we get one, adelingas, which means princes or noblemen. It's a plural form of the noun adeling. Oh, I didn't mention it before, but that A-E combination um, is called ash, and it represents, say, an ah sound, like the one uh, I'm saying in trap trap, hat, um, that kind of thing. Here in the word adeling, we see the return of that ing suffix we saw in kuning, the one that means belonging to. And the first part of that word is adele. Adele means noble. And this is the same root that gives us the name ethel, as well as adele, uh, through French, and the flower edelweiss, which is a compound of the German words edel, meaning noble, and weiss, meaning white. So our clause starts out, how the princes did something. What did the princes do? The princes ellen fremedon. And the word ellen here means courage or strength. And it could actually also be in the plural. It's the same in the singular and the plural. Uh, so we'd probably want to translate it as deeds of courage uh, rather than courages, which doesn't quite work in modern English. That is, if we want to put it in the plural. And here again, we see how often the verb doesn't show up where we'd expect it to in modern English. We'd expect to hear about how the princes did something rather than how the princes something did. In other words, the object of the verb, the thing that they did, shows up before the verb, the doing itself, in Old English, in this sentence at least. Old English grammar is, in this regard, much more like modern German than modern English. Just like in modern German, Old English verbs show up after their objects in certain contexts, and this is one of them. So the clause is, how the prince is something, courage. What's our verb going to be? Our verb is fremedon, accomplished or performed, which if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see fremman, to accomplish or perform. Uh, this actually comes from the same root as the word forward, and it has the meaning of advancing a project or promoting someone's interests, and that someone could include you. So it can also mean profit. Together with ellen, though, we probably want to translate it something like performed. So altogether, for this clause, we have how the prince's courages performed, or more idiomatically, how the prince's performed deeds of courage. Let's put it all together now into slightly more idiomatic modern English. Ah, we've found out about the force of the folk kings of the Spear Danes in days gone by, how the princes performed deeds of courage. And that is the first three lines of Beowulf overexplained. Okay, wow, uh, that was fun. I hope you found it fun as well, or uh, at least informative. If you did enjoy it, um, I guess this is the part where I say leave a like or subscribe or what have you. For me, it's uh, an indication that this is the kind of thing that I should be making more of. Um, so if you want to see more of it, uh, let me know. All right. Thanks again. And I will see you next time. I don't have a sign off yet, so I'll, I'll work on that.